Can you give me how I can? And if I want to use laser, will it still show up? No, you cannot. So, so I'll, I'll use this. That is your information. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. And nor normally I like to wander around, but because <coughs> they are recording the talk, rather than use the laser pointer, I will return here and use the mouse. You have, uh, has it turned on? Yeah, yes. Can you hear me back there? Good. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, so as Thibode mentioned, I um, write a column. I uh, used to write for a print publication called Embedded Systems Programming. It changed its name to Embedded Systems Design. And then, like so many high tech publications, it went out of print, and then now it's all that's left is the website. And, but embedded.com, uh, like many technical publications, stays in touch with its readership by doing annual surveys. And the one uh, item that always intrigued me was that they would ask the participants to complete that sentence. My current embedded project is programmed mostly in. And here is a sampling of an eight-year span of the responses to that question, which I think is a, a good cross-section of the industry. And there are a couple things that are worth noting that the, the top there, that's C. And that far and away uh, surpasses all of the others put together. And then the uh, second line there is C++. The dashed lines are the trend line. And so the, uh, what you see is that C++ is a distant second. Interestingly, the, uh, the only two other languages, they, they got responses from many, many languages, but most of them were in the 1% range. So I did not show them. Assembler turned out to be third, and Java was fourth. Um, now, this is not true necessarily of each market se segment, but as a, a broad sampling of people who <coughs> identify themselves as embedded developers, this is, this is the best data that I've seen. And so that's. Uh, Let me give you an overview of where I'm headed. The reason why I'm going to talk mostly about C and C++, well, it's, a, um, it's obvious that this is what dominates the industry. And I think most of us agree that the software we write, we want it to be reliable. And what I want to talk about is, you know, how does one achieve that reliability? And, and the uh, position I advocate fairly strongly, well, I think the best way to keep bugs out of your program is not to let them in there in the first place. And what I want to talk about is programming styles which achieve, which get you closer to this. This is not a target you can reach. It's simply something that you aspire to. And the question is, you know, what tools will help you achieve that aspiration the best? And I think this is a lost cause in C. You simply can't do it. Um, but what I want to try to show you is that C++ gives you a better fighting chance at this. Now, let me, you know, that right away, that may put some of you in a frame of mind that this guy's biased, right? In other words, and, and, and you can then proceed to filter everything I say uh, on that basis. Um, and I will tell you, I come from a back, Little, uh, little side I live in Ohio, and the way presidents are elected in this country, the uh, electoral system that we use, it turns out that because I live in Ohio, my vote counts more than yours. And unless you live in Florida. Um, and so I take that civic responsibility very seriously, and I'm, I participate in local politics there. And in the course of doing that, I've done an awful lot of reading on the underlying psychology of voters. And there is now a, a large body of literature on this, which basically says that most of us have the illusion that we're making rational decisions when we're mostly making emotional decisions. And I think that's true about stuff like this, too. And so if you, you know, what, what I'm going to ask you to do is try as hard as you can to give me a chance first on the technical issues before you judge that I'm biased. <clears throat> the, uh, 
back when I got, first got into this business, one of the uh, leading figures in the industry was a man named Edgar Dijkstra. And he, um, he was somewhat of a curmudgeon, often taking contrary positions on things. But, and he was highly critical of many of the early programming languages. And he, in one of his articles, he once said, the tools we use have a profound and devious influence on our thinking habits. And I tend to think this is true, that if the programming language you use is, has mechanisms which make it easy, convenient, and safe to express things in a certain way, you're going to gravitate toward that stuff. Just in the sense that early programming languages, the earliest Fortran dialects, did not have nice nested flow structures. They had ifs and go-tos. And so it was a labor to try to fashion just things we take for granted now, like while loops. And once programming languages had these things natively, nice bracketed flow structures, this discussion of structured programming became a non-issue. And, and I think the same thing is true when you make comparisons between modern languages, is that your reason for gravitating toward one language over another would be how well does it give me the tools that allow me to conveniently and safely express the ideas that I want to express. <clears throat> and so I think that part of the difficulty in moving from C to C++ is a matter of mindset. It's how do you think about the programming process and, um, and, and how you look at the tools that are given you by that particular language. And I think a lot of people stumble when they move from C to C++ because they don't really make the right cultural shift. They still try to look at C++ the way they look at C. And so what I want to do is I'm going to give you some very concrete programming examples, which um, I tried to keep the, the code snippets as to a minimum here, but they're to, to illustrate some very, very fundamental ideas about the nature of C versus C++. One of the most uh, commonly used functions in the standard C library is memcopy. And memcopy is, does some things very well in this case, what I'm doing is I'm simply copying the contents of one array to another array. And the beauty about memcopy is you can use it to copy anything. You can copy ints to ints, doubles to doubles. You can even copy one struct to another struct. And you can do it for arrays of any size. And so the question is, what's not to like? Well, plenty. For example, memcopy can copy things that are in incompatible types. You can, in this case, we're trying to copy an array of integers, I'm sorry, an array of doubles into an array of ints. And on most architectures, the physical size of a double is larger than an int. And the bit pattern layout is different. So all you're doing is picking up a byte at a time from the representation of one object and copying it into a byte in the other one and dramatically changing its meaning. And what you get is gibberish. And, but memcopy is more than happy to oblige. Similarly, you can overwrite the end of an array easily just by passing the wrong size. You said, I'm copying from an array of 20 elements into an array of 10. Sure, I'll do it. What's the problem? And so this is just a very small example of the general rule that C will compile all kinds of nonsense. It uh, basically. Um, it has a very lax approach to the checking that it does at compile time. And uh, you wrote it, it sails right through. And this is more so than most languages. It's C, plus C is probably the lowest of all high level languages in this sense, that it'll just let all sorts of nonsense leak through. And I think this breeds a very unfortunate mindset, which is. And I'm not accusing every C programmer of being this way, but I'm just saying this is a very common mindset, which is let's get the code to compile so you can get on to the real work. And what is that real work? It's debugging. <laughs> and what I'm going to suggest is an alternate view, which is that you should program in a style that turns potential runtime errors into compile time. And I think this is much more viable to do in C++ than it is in C. And the reason why is grounded in some very, very basic language properties. And 
Yeah, I'm just going to, as an aside here, most of the time when people do comparisons of C and C++, they're extolling the virtues of doing object-oriented programming in C++ and how much easier or better in some sense than it is in C. I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to hardly say anything today about object-oriented programming because I don't think anymore that that is really the core difference between these two languages. It, it has to do with something else. And that is the data typing system. Now, among programming languages, you have dynamic types, you have static types. Languages that do dynamic typing are, for example, Lisp and uh, Python. And I'm not talking, I'm not going to go into that because that's not the subject of today's talk and I, that's a digression I don't have time to do. I'll just focus on static typing. And basically, the static type of an object is the type that it is declared to have. So for example, this is saying that n has type int and d has type double and p is a pointer to a character. And the static type doesn't change during program execution. It doesn't matter what you store into that object, its type is always in. And so if it's something that doesn't fit, it just uh, gets rejected at compile time, you hope. In a dynamically typed language, you assign a different type to it and said, okay, I'm gonna change my mind. I'm now a float. I was an int, now I'm a float. That doesn't happen in C. Doesn't happen in C++. Now, what good is this feature? Well, one of the virtues is that it supports a very natural notation, operator overload. For example, we're used to using the equals operator to assign. And logically, you say, let's copy it. But if you look at the mechanics of what's involved in a copy, the actual machine instructions that are generated could be quite different from one type to another. For example, there, when you're assigning one character to another, it could be a move byte instruction. When you're assigning one into another, it could be a move word. And when it's doubles, it could be a move double word, or it could be two separate move instructions. You don't care about that usually when you're programming. You will when you're debugging, but when you're writing this, you say the compiler will choose the right instructions. I'm cool with that. Similarly with the plus operator here. If I add an int plus an int, I have a pretty good idea what's going to happen. It's probably going to use one machine instruction that's a, an integer add. But if I add a double plus an int, I can expect that it will use a different combination of machine instructions to somehow get the int and the double to add. And again, most of the time when I write this stuff, I'm just operating at a logical level, and I trust the <coughs> compiler to take care of this. So before I go on, I want to, normally when I teach a classroom setting on this, I would pause and give people an opportunity to interact with me on this. I'm just going to plow ahead. But just think for a moment. If somebody came up to you and asked, what's a data type? How would you define it? My experience is that most programmers, when they, that's a phrase they use commonly. And you know, uh, who was it? Uh, Justice Lewis Powell, I think, who said about pornography, I know it when I see it. Well, say, same thing with data. I, I know what it is when I see it, but if you ask me to define it in general, I struggle. Well, I think it's worth defining it precisely because it, it's important to the discussion we're about to have. And that in a statically typed language, a data type is a bundle of compile time properties associated with an object. And what are those properties? Well, they're usually things like the size and alignment of the storage that's used for it. That's at a, a physical level of it. But then there are logical things like, what is the set of values that you can put into that data type? And what are the permitted operations on that type? So for example, for type int on a 32-bit processor, Typically, the size and alignment is four bytes. The value is any integer in this range. And the operations are things like plus, minus, times, divide, assign, less than, greater than, and so on. It's also worthwhile asking, what can't you do? That's actually part of the type specification, is what you're not allowed to do with it. And for an int, examples of things that you can't do are you can't apply the indirection operator that says, Treat it as if it's a pointer and go fetch the storage whose address this thing contains. 
and you can't call it as if it's a function. Because those things are general, by experience, when programming languages used to allow this stuff, programmers would be dismayed that it compiled, <laughs> right? Because it became things that they had to debug. So in general, the type system in a programming language attempts to capture what the community uh, identifies as being a valid logical thing to do or that which should be prohibited because it's almost certainly a programming error. So among the things that are permitted are type conversions. C and C++ both support a range of implicit type conversions. And most of us say, yeah, that, that's pretty reasonable. You can convert an int into a long int. There's no loss of information when you do that. You can convert an int into a double. Actually, there's a potential for loss of information. Some compilers might give you a warning about that, but, but both C and C++ say that's permitted. But you can't convert a pointer into a double because we don't know what that means. So from this perspective, it turns out that the underlying machinery of a class, the thing that supports object-oriented programming in C++, is really just a struct. But the big difference is that a structure in C is a user-defined type with very lax constraints on what you're allowed to do with it. Meaning that there, you can go in and individually access members of the structure, and it's very hard to put constraints on this, the struct itself to say, I only want certain combinations of values to be valid inside the state of an object of that structure type. Whereas a C++ class lets you specify some fairly rigorous constraints on what you're allowed to do with objects of that type. It's really the type system. The difference is the treatment within the type system. So the other thing that I've alluded to is that type information helps prevent accidents. Like, for example, you can't divide a pointer, or you can't bitwise and a double. These are all because most people, if you ask them, what does that mean? It doesn't mean much. If you, if you were allowed to do it, you'd probably be dismayed with the result. You'd be looking at your output saying, how did it get into this state? And the answer is, well, because you were bitwise anding a double. Well, why didn't the compiler stop me? Well, it does. So here are some substantive differences between C and C++. One of them is the treatment of enumerations. Enumerations are a very nice way to just have a discrete set of integer-like values. For example, to represent the days of the week, you can have an enumerated type day and the months of the year. You can enumerate those. It's, it's nice, expressive program. But you may find this dismaying, but in C, all enumerations are just integers. So that it's perfectly valid in C to assign a day to have the value February, or to have a month equal to Tuesday. And a C compiler doesn't, won't say boo. Now, if you are using a, uh, some compilers may have a level of warnings, which will catch this, or you could be using a, a second tool, a static analyzer, which would have rules that would enforce a more rigorous se separation of this. And that's a good thing to do, but it's not a requirement of C that these types be kept separate. So in fact, you can even just assign an arbitrary integer to, a, to an enumeration value. But C++ considers all of these to be errors. C++ says, if you bother to declare an enumeration type, I'm going to keep them largely separate from each other. Now, for reasons of backward compatibility, it's not perfect in C++. There are still some implied conversions, like converting not an integer to an enum, but an enum back to an int can be done quietly in C. And you might not want that. So the latest version of the C++ standard actually has these things called enumeration classes, which turns off all the implied conversions. And you get an even more rigorous separation. C doesn't have anything like that. Another one is the treatment of pointer types. <laughs> Here I have two pointers, a pointer to an int and a pointer to a double. Now, most people would say you should not be allowed to just take a pointer to an int and copy it into a pointer to a double, because then you'd have a, something declared to be pointer to int that's actually pointing to the storage for a double. 
this is a bug waiting to happen. But if you carefully read the C standard, it turns out that assigning either the pointer to either one is a valid conversion in C. Now, once again, most people use a stat, if you're using a static analyzer, it'll catch that. And most C compilers have warning levels you can set that will flag that. But the rule in, in C is those are actually compatible for the purpose of assignment. C++ doesn't let you do this. It will just simply say that's an error. Now, the way around that is to use a cast. You can always force the compiler to shut up and let you do it, even if the compiler thinks it's hazardous by putting a, um, a cast in there. But the important thing to remember is just because you put a gag on the compiler, you know, it's still sitting in the chair, you know, but it's a bug. Um, and so if it later blows up, you know, and you take the gag off, it'll say, I told you, I tried to tell you, and you made me shut up. So casts in general are a sign that you are um, trying to do something that is almost always a mistake. The type system wouldn't permit it. Uh, and so, so these are things that you should use very sparingly and very cautiously. And so my claim is that when you're putting casts in your code, you're really going in the wrong direction from the aspiration, which is you want to program in a style which turns runtime errors, potential runtime errors, into compile time errors. And using a cast is basically saying, I want to turn a compile time error into a potential runtime error. <coughs> and in general, avoiding casts is hard in C. And it's often much easier in C++ for reasons I will show you in a specific example coming up. Now, the truth is that the memcopy function, actually, whatever you pass it, the semantics are defined to copy character by character. So you pass it doubles, and it will actually do a byte by byte copy. You pass it. Um, a structure, it does a byte by byte copy. Now, if you actually look in the implementation of some libraries, they'll actually do some uh, analysis to say, oh, but if these things are aligned and in a multiple of four, I will try to do word copies as an optimization. But it always says, but if that fa all else fails, I'm going to copy it byte by byte. And so the, you would think, OK, memcopy is really a function which takes pointers to characters. But in truth, that's not way it's declared. Uh, and the reason is that with the type checking that goes on, if, if you have, um, if you are using something like a static analyzer or a compiler that has higher warning levels, then you would always have to write casts on every single call to memcopy. Every time you pass in anything that's, that's not an array of characters, you have to cast it to a pointer to character. And so the escape mechanism for this is the introduction of the type void star. And that is actually the way memcopy is declared. It says I take a pointer to void. And what is void? Well, void is actually the generic data pointer type, meaning it's the pointer that's compatible for assignment with every other pointer type. And so as shown in this example, you can take a pointer to integer and assign it to pointer to void, pointer to double, pointer anything, copy it to pointer to void, and the compiler doesn't require a cast and doesn't complain. <clears throat> well, th this is the moral equivalent of using a cast. It's just not explicitly saying the cast. You know, it's, a, it's really a programming convenience. But if you think about what pointer to void does, it says, I don't want any checking going on here. I'll take anything, including things that mismatch. And so pointer to void lets you take a, in this example, I've got a pointer to a gadget, which I assign, initialize the pointer to void. And then sometime later, I take that pointer to void and copy it to a pointer to a widget. And now, without any cast at all, I have inadvertently converted the type of a pointer to point to something that is really not supposed to be pointing to. And once again, what the standard says about this is that now, if you dereference that pointer, the behavior is undefined. You know, expect something bad to happen. Expect to have to use the debugger to discover that. And so I will claim that just like using casts is something you want to use sparingly and cautiously, 
using pointed avoid is in the same boat. And once again, it's hard to do in C, much easier to do in C++. And again, pointed avoid takes your programs in the wrong direction. It's turning, turning potent, things that were compile errors into potential runtime errors. Well, at this point, I want to introduce a, a related concept. See, I've been extolling. I haven't shown you how to do it yet, but I have been uh, trying to show why it is that the culture of C is not conducive to this approach that you want to program in a style that turns potential runtime errors into compile time errors. And um, there is a very prominent gentleman in this industry named Scott Myers, written a number of books on C++ programming. But I think his, possibly his single biggest con contribution to the computing industry is a paper that he wrote that you can find uh, on his website. And it was called The Most Important Design Guideline. Question mark. And here's what he said. He said, you want to make interfaces easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. That's actually a pretty good piece of advice, is that as you are crafting components for yourself and especially for other people to use, what you want to do is give them something that's easy for them to use correctly and hard for them to use incorrectly. Why is this a good idea? Well, think about it. From their perspective, if I give you a component and set it you up so that, oh, and by the way, I tell you, and this will make your life easier. And then it turns out you can pass all kinds of nonsense to it that forces you to go and debug code that you didn't write yourself. After a while, you're not going to want to use that component. And you're going to probably be very skittish about the next component I try to pawn off on you. You know, it really diminishes your credibility. So what you want to do is hand, if you make components to share, you want to really make sure you're making the other person's life easier. And so you make the interfaces easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. And memcopy is a really good example of something that is neither easy to use correctly nor hard to use incorrectly. There are plenty of ways to screw it up. And just to review them, it's that a typical call to memcopy looks like that, where you're passing in the two things, copy from this into this for this many bytes. I think this would be easier. If you could just say, copy from here to here, and let the compiler figure out how much to copy. Because when, when you have to explicitly supply the amount to be copied, what guarantee is it that you're not going to cause some kind of an overflow? And then, the, of course, even better would be this. Because even the, the second example there, the just a mem copy without supplying an end, there's always the open question of which one of these is the source and which one is the destination. But this one, there's a lot less question. You know, it's, a, it's such a widely accepted practice that the destination is on the left. Um, now, in C++, can you write one of those that goes the other way? Yes, you could. But it's such a red flag, it's the kind of thing that you know, you're going to get hauled into your manager's office for doing something like that. Um, it's, it's so obviously against the grain of what should be done. Once again, memcopy lets you do things like fill an array with garbage or copy past the end. Now, what's the alternative? I, I didn't want to just glibly say it's not possible to do this in C. It is. But it's really impractical that you can, if you wanted to, write all these copy functions for all the different types and all the different sizes that you could possibly imagine wanting. And because of the way pointers to arrays work in C, if you're willing to pass these things by a pointer to an array rather than in the usual mechanism as, by just as a pointer to its first element, you can actually get rigorously uh, type-checked copy operations at compile time, such that you can avoid all those problems. But think about how many of these you would have to write. And no matter how many you've written, you're always going to have to write more for the next problem that you've solved, where you have yet a different array type or diff a different array size. It's just not feasible to do. 
So what's the alternative? Well, C++ makes it really remarkably easy. You can write a function template that does an array copy that simply says, you give me the source and the destination, and I will figure out at compile time what the sizes are and whether the types are compatible, and I'll do a copy for you. And here's how you implement it. And I don't, my purpose in showing you this code is not to go over it in detail, but just to show you how short it is. And if you look at the function body, the part just below the stuff highlighted in red, you'll see the body is just a for loop that any C or C++ programmer could read. The only thing that's uh, challenging about it is the parameter passing conventions of an array to, it's actually a reference to an array of n elements of, of type t, where t types t and n are parameterized. My claim is that this array copy is easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. You just say, I want to copy from here to here. You name the arrays and the compiler will check, are they the same type and are they the same dimension? And if they are, it'll generate the code. And if they're not, it'll just reject it. And, and the kinds of errors you can make with memcopy simply can't happen. And the, uh, the fascinating thing is that if you look at the code that's generated by it, it's every bit as good and often better than what you would get from memcopy. So it tastes great and it's less failure. That's what's so good about it. Now, by the way, it may be, I'll allow for a possibility here, it may be that the implementation on, of memcopy on a given architecture actually takes advantage of machine instructions. Some people like to refer to them as bit blast instructions, which will do large block moves. And you say, that doesn't take advantage of that. Well, there are actually ways that you can write compile time logic in C++ that would say, if this is a type that can safely be memcopied, then call memcopy instead of doing this loop. And so that what you can get is that you could actually write a version of array copy which does inline substitution to a call to memcopy. So it would never be worse than memcopy. And this is something that's fairly easy to, to implement and to demonstrate to yourself that it actually does what it's advertised. Well, what about arrays of different sizes? Suppose you say, ah, but I have a reasonable extension here. I, I, I got you. You know, the, the one you just wrote requires that the two arrays be exactly the same size. That's a constraint I can't live with. And I, what would be a reasonable alternative? And the reasonable alter alternative might be to say, well, um, how about if the, if the destination array is at least as big as the source? In other words, you allow them to be of different sizes as long as it won't cause an overflow. You're copying from a, a no greater than array to an array that will fit. So in this example, copying two arrays of the same size is no problem. Copying from a bigger array, an array of 20 elements into 10, that would overflow and should be an error. This one, you're copying from the smaller array to the bigger array, that should fit. Can we do that? And the answer is, piece of cake. You just take the array copy I just wrote, you add another template parameter, and what you do is you put in a check on the relative sizes of the two arrays. And if the condition fails because the source is bigger than the destination, then it will throw an exception. Ah, but let's look critically at that for a moment. This is actually a comparison of the array dimensions at runtime. But array dimensions are something that we know at compile time. See, the compiler is actually able to figure out, because the dimension of array is part of its type, it'll know when it's generating the code for that call that, in fact, the, it's valid or not. Well, there's a very simple thing you can do, which is turn that if statement and the throw, which throws a runtime exception, into what's called a static assert. And the static assert simply says, test two values known at compile time. And if that condition is true, just keep going along as if everything's OK. And if it's false, then you print an error message containing the character string, which is supplied in the assertion. You can actually 
test things at compile time instead of at runtime. And this is, again, easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly, and it generates code which competes incredibly well with memcopy. It's at least as good, probably, and may in fact be better than memcopy. Now yet another possibility is that the C++ library offers something called a vector object. It's a class template. You can make a vector of ints, a vector of doubles, a vector of widgets, and the vector allows, it actually is a variable length array which, keep, which knows its size at runtime. So this is something that's dynamically varying at runtime. You can, but the beauty of it is you can assign one vector to another using an assignment operator. And I will claim that this is even, that this is easier to use than array copy because it makes it abundantly clear which is the source and which is the destination. Um, but it has some drawbacks. One is that the vector is implemented commonly using dynamic memory, and that could easily be verboten in your environment. There's, you know, the dynamic memory in some environments is considered to be the mark of the devil. And so the other problem is that the actual implementation of the vector class can be criticized as being hard to use incorrectly. Uh, I'm sorry, it isn't hard to use it correctly. There are places where you can pass parameters which would cause errors which could only be diagnosed at <coughs> runtime. You know, you'd be undefined behaviors. And so um, this really doesn't fit the bill of being easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. But the nice thing about C++ is that if the language doesn't give you exactly what you want, you can often fashion a class which will do it. And it's not too difficult to write a vector-like class template that avoids dynamic memory and is easy to use correctly. Now, you, it will impose certain constraints that occur if you have fixed-sized underlying implementations. You have to decide how you're going to deal with potential overflows. Many of them could be turned into compile errors, but some of them would be have, have to be handled as runtime errors. But they could be handled as overt runtime errors. Does the array have the same problem? STD array, uh, there, there is a class template in, in the latest C++ standard called array, which is, has many of the similar characteristics, but it does not support operations like whole array assignment. And so it does support indexing and a, a number of other, you can compute the iterators and things like that, but it doesn't have whole array assignment the last time I looked. <coughs> So once again, so actually, uh, I'm doing okay on time here, it looks like. So um, I wasn't sure exactly how long this talk would go, so I, um, I had my summary slides here. I'm actually going to go on and do this uh, previous, this next example, uh, because I do have the time. So um, I'm going to take a look now at some very low-level software issues. Um, I... Um, have done a lot of dabbling with how does one write device controls in C and C++. And again, this is an area where I have people come up to me and say, you can't do this stuff efficiently in C++. And I say, well, that's fun, because I'm doing it. And in fact, um, if you go out to embedded.com, the website that I write for, and look at, um, I wrote, a, an article entitled Measuring Instead of Speculating, in which my readers challenged me about this very issue. And so I did some fairly elaborate m measurements where I wrote a driver for a timer and how much effort it takes to configure the timer and sample the values in the timer and things like that. And I wrote it in both C and in C++. And I compiled it on three different compilers of three different vintages. And I used all the options I could think of of inlining and non-inlining and stuff like that. And what I found was that um, the, when you did function inlining, the C and the C++ tied each other perfectly. And when you did non-inlining, in general, across all three different compilers from different vendors, the non-inline functions in C++ outperformed the non-inline functions in C. And that one stunned me. I expected them to also be equal, and it turned out that the C++ generated better code. 
measurably better. And I wasn't making it up. I actually showed the code, and you, you can reproduce it, the experiments yourself. <laughs> so I, I just want to show you a little bit about how this idea of turning potential runtime errors into compile time errors affects the way you would write low-level code like drivers. It's just by way of background to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Most modern architectures uh, communicate with devices through what are called device registers. And the most common architecture these days is to use memory mapped registers, meaning that the, uh, the address circuitry is configured in a way to fake the processor out into thinking that it's reading and writing from memory when it's actually reading and writing from the controllers for certain devices. But you, that, that allows the processor to use the same instruction set for doing I.O. that it would use for doing other data processing. <coughs> now, when you deal with a particular chipset, or if you ever work with an evaluation board, usually the vendor of that board will provide you know, a compiler, maybe a crippled compiler, you know, something that only lets you use it for a period of time or only lets you develop programs of a certain size or turns off certain functionality. But they give you uh, usually a lot of header files, some object files that allow you to do some functions that access those registers. And it's very common to see that the registers all are declared with the same type or maybe just a few types where there's a device, a 32-bit register and a 16-bit register. If you're working with an architecture like the ARM, they're very likely to all be the same size. So here is code I've seen many times in many places where you just see a big header file with some macros defining the essentially the addresses of the timer mode register, the timer data register, the, the UART registers, or the DMA controller registers, or whatever. And it's just one macro after another like that. And um, because the, the vendor of you know, the chipset that you're trying to use is trying to appeal to both a C and a C++ audience, and the C++ programmers can always tolerate the C, and you know, the, the C the C programmers, so they write in the lowest common denominator, which is doing something like this, and say, yeah, it may not be the greatest way to do in C++, but I don't want to write both a separate C and C++ version of this software, and people just pick this up and use it. And my claim about this is that this is free software that you can't afford to use. Another word, way to think of it is, it's, you, know, you may have heard the advertising slogan, the gift that keeps on giving. Well, this is the gift that keeps on taking. Uh, it's that you'd, you'd say, well, it was free. How can I afford not to use it? Because it just sets you up for one bug after the other. It's a terrible software interface. So for example, if you have a put function there that operates on UARTs, there are going to be parameters of type pointer to devreg here and here. But notice that they're the same type. The expectation is that the status register is first and the transmit buffer is second. What happens if you get them in the wrong order? The registers are the same type. The compiler can't check it. What happens if you pass the status register from one UART and the transmit buffer from another? Hey, they're the same type. No problems. What happens if you pass a timer register in? No problems. The compiler will just accept it, and you get the joy of debugging it. Clustering these things into C structures is much better. And then when you write a function like this, like enable the timer, what you're passing in is something of a distinct pointer type. And uh, you leave it to the timer enable function to figure out which registers it needs to access. You can do this in a C++ class, and that's even better because this then makes all of the registers themselves private and inaccessible. They're accessible only through the permitted operations list, listed in the public section. And so now you get nice type checking. This is easy to use correctly because if you set up a pointer to a UART and you call the put function, the compiler will check is put a valid op operation. And if it's not, it'll reject it. If you try to do it with a timer, it'll say, hey, timer doesn't have a put operation. 
I will just reject it. You don't have to debug it. It just doesn't compile. But here is something way cooler than that. It's not at all uncommon. Well, most registers are going to be read-write registers. They permit both write operations and read operations. But every so often, you get a register which is read-only, or you get something which is write-only. An example here in our UART is that the useStat register and the receive uh, buffer register is a read-only register. Now, making them read-only in C or C++ is fairly easy in that you can just use the const qualifier. Const in this context means that you can only read from it, you can't write to it. But what do you do about a write-only register? There's no comparable keyword in C or C++. What do you do? The answer in C++ is you write a template. You can actually fashion a template very quickly, very easily, which will put, make this thing into a write-only entity. And what happens is the spurious errors that you would normally get that if you actually try to read from a write-only register now become a compile time error. You know, it just, as Forrest Gump would say, one less thing. And just, I'm not expecting you to read this code, but I just want to show you the scale of what we're talking about. That's all it is to implement a write-only data type. This works for, I've been using this thing for years in code that I've been writing. And it does what it's supposed to do, which is that it, it restricts the data type to only allow initialization of an assignment to the write-only entity and any other accesses to it become compile errors. And so you can, backing up, you can go and, and do that. And that's notationally very nice, and you get a nice compile time guarantee. And you can demonstrate that this is at no runtime penalty. It takes up neither space nor time to, to do this in the execution flow. So it costs nothing in code, nothing in data space, nothing in runtime. So here again is the bottom line, which is I think you want, it's very much in your interest to learn to program in a style that turns potential runtime errors into compile time errors. You know, this, this is a nirvana you can't reach, but it's something that you can get closer to. And um, you know, there'll still be things to debug, but there should be less to debug. And the wonderful thing about this approach is that compile time checks generate no code. They have no, uh, they do not increase the physical size of your program. And they use no runtime. And this is nice, whereas you can ship a program that fails a runtime check, it is really, really hard to ship code to a customer that has compile errors in it. You know, they just won't, uh, I have yet to encounter an example where the, where the customer says, sure, I'll take it. Um, and, of, and, and so in the same spirit, you want to make sure that you have interfaces that are easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. You use the type system as much as possible to enforce this. And, my, and I hope I have shown, at least in a small way, that this is much easier to do in C++ than it is in C. And, and, and so I'll say is that although C++ is al almost always sold as but it does a wonderful job with object-oriented programming. Notice, aside from wrapping things in, in a class now and then, that's not what I think is the real selling point. <coughs> the real selling point is that it's a language in which you can come closer to saying, here's what I meant to do. Here's how I want to use this thing. And if I ever deviate from that, compiler, please help me. Tell me. So I don't have to spend time debugging it. Okay. And I think that's all I have to say. <coughs> yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be questions today, <coughs> right? OK. Yeah. Uh, just a comment. I, 
I, several years ago, I was between task numbers at JPL. And so somebody said, oh, we've got all this C++ code. We just need you to port it to a different platform. I said, okay, well, that sounds within my abilities. I and two other people spent a year on this. We could never make it run. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem was that the people who had written this thought they were being clever. They used operator and name overloading everywhere. And to be honest, we couldn't figure out how the thing even worked. And so it seems to me that C++ gives you just as much rope to hang yourself on as C. It's just kind of a different color of rope? Well, the, the problem is that I think that there, um, you have to manage things carefully in terms of reining in overly enthusiastic programs. You know, that, that there is this problem of people taking the feature and just turn it, turning it, just going hog wild. A good example of this is um, there, the Boost library. I, I don't mean to be smirch it, but these are people who just spend their, you know, it's really fun for them to write all these whiz bang templates, and it's a good thing that they're experimenting with that, and there's a lot of good work that came out of it. But some of that stuff is really write only code. You know, somebody wrote it, and then nobody else can go back and read it. So there is this problem that, yes, C allows for a, um, the possibility that your most skilled programmers could write code that your average programmer can't read. And so it has to be monitored. There has to be some discussion about what's the culture of the environment. How fast are we willing to move and educate people in order to be able to, to keep up with this? And, and it turns out that I think most of the disputes about C++ and C are more in that realm. I think it, from a purely technical standpoint, C++ just beats the pants off of C. And that these horror stories that you're talking about where you know, people were confronted with code they couldn't read was uh, more of the human side of, of the issue. Now, uh, let me just add to that is, see, there is a practice, a common practice within the computing industry that whoever it is that latches onto some new technology uh, often feels compelled to sell it as, as if this is the solution to all of our problems. Right? I went through that back in the 80s when I was at a university. AI was going to solve everything. You know, it's just, if you weren't doing AI, you were just completely out of step. And it turned out that it solves some problems. It doesn't solve everything. And when objects were introduced, I remember the hype about objects are going to solve every problem under the sun. And people started programming that way, and they got burned. And that's where some of the bad press comes from. What I object to is the statements when people say, I took this thing and I took C and I rewrote it in C++ and it was bigger and slower. And I say, I got to see that. You know, you, you must have done, misunderstood the language or felt compelled to use an unnecessary feature because if you just take your C and recompile it to C++, you get the same stuff. And, and it's when people have, th that's what I'm trying to address is that misinformation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you have any recommendations for, uh, we r r run into a lot of issues where we, we have to exchange some data from one node over to another. And it seems that I see a lot in flight software that we don't really ever do the serialization. We just, we're, we're, it's just a mem copy into a socket or a mm -hmm. mem copy something and send for over right. or something else. And then the worst case is when it's going from one endiness over to another, do we have any recommendations to where we can, we don't have to worry about AVI as much? Or wh what, what can we do to make that easier in C++? Uh, oh. What you have to do, uh, the question. Yeah, to you know, f fix. You know, what you want to be able to do is program natively in <coughs> two different architectures where you're just what declaring you ints and you're just declaring you know, uh, doubles and things like that. And then you want to be able to send them from one to the other where the endianness is different. Right, right. Yes. Now, my understanding is that on ne network architectures, there is a, you know, within the uh, protocols, there's a convention about big endianness and little endianness. You have right. to pick 
they arbitrarily picked one over the other. Right. And I think that that is your safest bet to make sure that you, you know, that's the way you train. Okay, so just keep right. the same architecture. Well, what you want to do, I think is possible, is to craft in your C++ a wrapper around the sending operations so that when, based on- Serialization. The, yeah, when you do the serialization, based on the static type of what you're sending in, you can say, oh, I have to flip it. And the flipping is done automatically behind an implicit conversion inside the API for that. Yeah, and that's what I want to do. Yes. But normally then it gets, it, it will it will be, a, it will be, be flagged in review as um, it's eating up cycles. So don't do it like that. But then we run into problems where, where well, now. Well, where else do you do it? No, it's got to be done. It has to be done somewhere. Yes. So yeah. uh, not ha having been able to discuss with the people who are complaining about that, I, you know, I'd need to know what their technical argument is. Well, it went, ooh, sorry. So what what uh, what what I see a lot then is they'll make it so it's the same architecture on the flight vehicle, mm -hmm. and then uh, then it's going to be different on the simulation, and then it has to be fixed in simulation because we think well we have all this processing, you know you know we, we have all the CPU in the world over in the sim, but mm -hmm. we also don't really have all the labor in the world to write the code, which fix you know which is, is going to have to fix all that deserialization. Anyways, the, uh, with other languages you know it's it's not so much of an issue. But since uh, since with C plus plus it's 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 less or it's more independent of the platform. It's not an issue in C. Oh no, I mean uh, like with 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 Ada, it's not as bad. Oh uh, yeah, it's it's just as bad with C. Yeah, uh, but but with, with other languages itself, it's really you know it's it's not it's not as much of an issue. Or with Java, uh, it's not it's not as much of an issue because of, of the serialization that's you know uh, b b built in the objects them themselves, but. But well, you know, it seems it, like it's. I'm not a Java expert, but does Java guarantee the Indianness of all data types? Does anyone know the answer? Yeah, I'm not really much of a Java person either. Yeah, is that how they solve it? Is it's, it's just a lot easier the, for the serialization in Java. Always says it's big Indian, or always says it's little Indian. Yeah, you can serialize a lot easier. Yeah, so if it's executing on a machine which doesn't match, you pay for that at the VM level. Everything, all your arithmetic is slower. So. Right, but you don't have to write the code. It's not an issue in Java. It's not. It's not it's as be much. not an issue because you don't have to write it. Agreed to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways, that's 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 one of the issues I've been seeing, and I was wondering, and I, I was always hoping that you, you know I would see something in the language. Uh, no, I don't have anything that w to, that will be a oh wow that's brilliant. No, I don't have that. So uh, I was your your chart of how C the trend line is going up, C plus plus trend line is going down. Um, kind of tying that to discussion that we had yesterday about finding good embedded programmers out of universities and I've tried to relate those two together because if you think about, and even Dijkstra's comment, we, if I interpret it correctly, that we tend to use what we're familiar with, whether it's the best thing or not. Yes. And uh, so I think the challenge is, and your answer may be to hire you to come do training, but you know, if you have existing and experienced programmers that know C, they're going to probably continue to do C, and that's probably why that trend line continues to at least be flat or even increasing. And so you say, okay, well, what can maybe trigger a shift towards C++? You think, well, we've got new, you know, hires coming out of college. They're probably getting trained more in C++ than C these days. The challenge is that doesn't work because they've been trained in C++ for the big, you know, or desktop and desktop. server apps. And, right. and so it doesn't translate, and so we get them in this, okay, forget the C++, that's not working, let's go back to C. It, it, you know, again, your answer may be to hire you. What's, how, do we, how do we resolve this? You know, how do we ever get past this issue? <laughs> well, I mean, that, that hiring somebody to train as, you know, our mentor is one way to do it. The, um, yeah, I don't have a one-size-fits-all answer to that. You have to look at the organizational culture, what, the commitment is to uh, the skills of the, the people that are there, and unfortunately, the emotional commitments that people have to to their own skills. You know, some people get defensive when you tell them, "Well, you know, there is a better tool you could be using," and trying to convince them of that. Well, that that implies, well, what I'm doing isn't good enough right now, and so the. Uh, but generally, what I tell people is, 
that the, the right thing to do is to make the commitment to training because eventually it will catch up with you. Eventually you will have trouble finding skilled programmers that are not, that, that haven't learned, that don't want to program in an object-oriented language. You know, it's like there's still code on Wall Street written in COBOL. And COBOL, if you're a COBOL programmer, I think you can make an awful lot of money if you can find one of those jobs. But that puts the people who have that code base in a very tenuous situation. And I think that's going to happen to the in industry that continues to cling to C. At some point, it's going to be hard to find the, the people. But I, I do agree. Most programmers coming out of college don't really appreciate the resource constraints of most embedded systems. And they tend not, when they bring their object-oriented skills to that, they tend not to be as resource conscious, and there's a culture mis mismatch that you have to work out typically through training and mentoring. Other questions? Yes. So since a lot of us are constrained from using uh, memory allocation, yes. and that rules out some big portions of the standard library, I was wondering if there's um, any efforts on this, some of the standardized committees yes. to have uh, you know, a library we could use that doesn't allocate so that we don't have to roll our own? Um, I'm not aware of such an effort. I, I could blather on for a while, but that basically the answer is I, I can't. Uh, I don't think there's a replacement, for example, for many STL components. Although, I will say that much of the STL, see, the components like vector and map, those rely on dynamic memory. But many of the algorithms, the transformation algorithms, the copy algorithms, all those things, do, can work with arrays as well as they can work with um, the varying length structures. So you can still tap into a large set of the algorithms if you're prohibited from using dynamic memory. Hey, uh, so also an answer of uh, finding experienced people, what I noticed is the tr a trend towards programming has become so accessible. So now then we see basically every scientist and engineer coming out of school is a programmer, but not necessarily a software expert. Um, I don't know if you had, if you've observed this, thought about this, or if anyone else had comments on, you know, how do we move forward as software discipline experts <laughs> um, in a world where most people are programmers? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, um, the analogy may be a poor one is I remember, I used to play racket sports tennis and racquetball. And uh, I had a colleague who was really good at tennis uh, who also played racquetball. He said that the appeal of racquetball is everybody is instantly mediocre, <laughs> right? Whereas with tennis, you go out there and it, you, sometimes it takes a long time just to get the ball over the net the first time. But anybody can hit that wall in a racquetball court. And, it, and C, I think, has that appeal, is that you pick up C and you're instantly mediocre. Uh, getting good at it takes skill. C++, the problem is that getting from that mediocre to getting skilled at it takes a lot more training. And given that so many people who are doing embedded work come from areas which is not, not software, they're electrical engineers or they're physicists, the, the part of the culture is this any language worth using is one you can teach yourself. And my experience is, but the really rich languages like C++ don't really fit that culture. You do have to train people to think differently, to understand things like data types, which are not self-evident to many people. And uh, so I do think that the progress is made through a commitment to some kind of improved education. And that's a, that's a culture, that's a management issue, which above my pay grade. I could I can add to that, which is um, on Monday I presented some things about the issues with software release and the quality gates you have to jump through to get that software released. Uh, same thing at NASA. Everybody is a programmer. I mean, everybody. And But to release the software, share the software, and reuse the software, you have to have package it up so that buyer beware is available to you 
so that you know what quality it was put together, what document sets, how it was tested, what its limitations are, and things like that. So on Monday, I presented how we could reduce the release overhead, but this is one case where you're dealing with the risk of good software or reusable software, that you're trying to reduce that risk of getting in trouble by using it. Any other questions? So I'm a little slow answering the, his question. There is a W21, WG21 working group on embedded C++ now, and I, uh, the guys from the Artems community on it have done DO178 qualifications. So they, I don't know what they're up to, but they have published things recently. So okay, very good. I'll take a take a look at it. Questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's Thank move on. So Thank much. you very much. Uh,